All right, well, this is James in the Giant Economy. Welcome to part two of Black Gold, Texas Tea. All right, this is gonna be, uh, on the first video, I went over kind of the process of how we drill oil out and the importance of constantly drilling more out. If you didn't watch the video, I heavily, heavily suggest you do it. Uh, not just because it gives me views and helps my ego, but because it is actually some meaningful knowledge and helps you understand the real reasons of why exploration is so important, right? Um, so on this, one, we're just going to go over some random facts that I learned um, that are that are, have to do with this. is in no particular order, um, so I'm just going to kind of go through them. Um, uh, one of the things I talked with actually another guy here is that for mineral investment owners like myself and even oil and gas companies, uh, fracking creates better returns. Well, what do you mean by that, James? So when you own an oil, uh, a mineral, right? Um, okay, think about a box or whatever, right? Um, in the in, in the in the early days, they only had vertical wells, right? You drilled up here and you could just go down, but all of this was was rock. Oh, my oil's leaking. Anyway, all of that was rock, and but you still had to drill through it to get to right here to this nice, sweet oil uh, portion, right? And down here's more rock, right? So really, all you're getting is, is this right here. So if you have one vertical well, all you can do is you can drill, get oil from a certain parameter from here as, as it flows through, right? Um, you can't go farther out, okay? And this stuff that you drilled through to get to it, doesn't matter, it's just rock. There's no oil or, or, or anything of, of value there. But now, with the advent of horizontal drilling and fracking, what you can do is you can drill down to this section and you can send a pipe a mile out or two miles sometimes and you can frack it all and you can pull it all in. So you're not just getting more oil, you're getting exponentially more oil. And that is why, um, and the more you draw out, the more profits that you make as a mineral owner, right? So that's why if we own you know, half this box or whatever, instead of them just putting it here, they can drill a miles in each direction and pull more out quicker and more efficiently and therefore we make more more efficiently <laughs> right because we are just on the coattails of the oil and gas company so fracking makes our profits not just go up by a little bit not but go double but exponentially as the oil and gas company pulls exponentially more oil out of the ground again because we get paid off every drop off every iota of petrol that they pull out right um up here, you know, the, the Oklahoma City trip is the in the Anadarko Basin, um, and basins, you need space to, to put drills in the ground, right? You have to have pad sites and everything, and you can't just drill, you can't just, two companies can't just put um, like 10 pad sites all together, right, onto one. Uh, you have pressure issues, but you have other things as well. Um, so you need some room to expand, right? Um, you need some distance between the two rigs, uh, unless you're unless you're cooperating with, with one at the same time. Um, and so, in West Texas, I haven't been out there yet, but <clears throat> I've heard you walk out there and there's just oil derricks everywhere, everywhere, right? Um, you could trip and fall on one, uh, kind of is, is the sense that you get. Um, up here in Oklahoma and Darko, there's a lot of free space. There's a lot of room for development and future potential. So as a mineral owner, as I own these things, you know, and I don't simply they just sit there, they don't cost me any money to own, but as oil and gas companies come in and further develop and expand, I make more, and not just a little bit more, exponentially more as time goes on. As, as a mineral owner, my time and my uh, patience is very, very heavily rewarded as oil and gas companies continue to expand. All right, another cool thing is, you know, a lot of times we see in movies, we see the oil wells, uh, a lot of times they're, they're offshore and everything, and there's, you know, a big explosion, and just the whole thing, this, this, this giant, you know, three football fields of a thing is just going up in flames. It makes a great movie, great movie. Um, and so we think that is what happens over here in the shale regions, right? Where we're drilling on land, not on a platform in the, in the ocean, but we're drilling on land, and... What I came to realize is 
well, let me ask you this. How big do you think the size of that hole that they drill is? Give you some time. I thought it was enough to drive a car through, right? Um, I thought you could throw a body into it. It was that big, right? It's just this giant, like, um, the, the 300, you know, from the movie 300, this giant pit, and then we just pulled oil out of it. Turns out they're about this big. This is a salad plate. Can fit over my head, most of it at least. Um, that's how big these holes are that the oil and gas companies are drilling to pull out all the oil that we use, to pull out barrels and barrels a day, um, sometimes up to 6,000 barrels a month, right? It's a, it's a hole this big, um, and they're drilling down a mile and typically across a mile or two depending, right? Um, so I thought that was really cool. Like you could stick your hand into it, but you couldn't put your leg, your foot. If you ran over that hole, it would it would probably wouldn't even feel like a speed bump in your car. Um, so I thought that was just kind of a, a unique, kind of cool um, uh, little insight that we got. Um, so and it begs a question. Well, if if you got this little hole here. Why does it cost like eight to twelve million right now to set up an oil um, to set up an oil rig uh, to set up an oil well? Um, well, I learned a lot about that too. So the majority of the the cost that goes into setting up an oil well and really the expense and all the work is done up front is through sand, water, and manpower. That's it. That is the majority of it. You do have piping, you do have equipment and stuff like that, but the majority of it is is sand water and manpower right these companies are pumping like 18 tons of sand into the well when they frack it and about the same amount of water it's just a huge you saw these these almost 18 wheeler boxes of sand that they're just constantly pumping in every hour in order to frack it um now that but the 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 uh, the roughnecks man they have a rough job they're not called roughnecks for for a little reason for one they are typically two weeks on two weeks off right so you don't see your family for two weeks but it's not just hey I'm gonna kick my feet up and enjoy things or just gonna have an easy work day no this is rough work this is twelve hours minimum on twelve hours off every day for the next fourteen to fifteen days okay and I'll tell you these spots out here in Oklahoma and West Texas. It's not Vegas. There's not fun to do. And you don't have time or energy for that anyway. So you are there to work and be bored and get work done and then go home, rest for two weeks, and you're back on for two weeks. But not only that, but they have 12 hour shifts. So you have two teams in a sense that one's on 12 hours, the other's sleeping, right, during the day. Then they swap, one's on for 12 hours going through the night, and the other team is resting. So when they are drilling and fracking these, it's a 24-hour job. It is go, go, go until the, until the job is done. Um, so it is, is a rough life. And there is a lot of manual labor, especially when you are drilling it. One of the guys that was actually uh, giving us some education about this, he used to uh, work in West Texas as a roughneck. And he would tell us about um, when they are, are drilling the wells, they you have to manually put in the pipe, right? There's, there's not a robot or anything to do. You, it, it comes from manpower. And so... You do it with 15 foot sections, okay? Um, and so you have to do 15 feet, you, you attach it to the, the one at the bottom, and you pull it down, attach the new one, pull it down, attach the new one, attach the new one. I think he said it takes 30 minutes to an hour for each section or something like that on average. I, I forget the details on that. But if you're doing 15 feet, let's just say 30 feet every hour, and you've got to go a mile down. It's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot. And these things aren't, aren't light either. You got to pick those things up, put them on. You're you're 30, 40 feet in the air when you're doing this stuff. So it is. There are quite a lot of risks. Is what I want to. One of the things I learned and I want to share with you. Um, and these, you know, some some people give oil companies a lot of crap, um, but they're really doing some high level. Uh, dangerous work and um, you know there, there are people that are they're doing that just you know working to feed their family and in a spot to where they can't see their family you know for two weeks at a time it's rough it's not easy um, and they get paid a lot of money um, and at the same time there are some people that, that are 
that are doing more of the technical work that are on site. They're just looking at screens for 12 hours a day. Sounds great at first, and maybe for a day or two it is when you're comp- when you're in comparison working outside. But uh, I'll tell you this right now from from a guy who works through computers all day. It's not too glorious in, you know, a few months afterwards. So um, it's still pretty rough, especially the amount of attention you have to do. So these are some rough jobs, but the majority of the expenses that go into wells are, are not in the upkeep. In fact, in the upkeep, we actually, one of the first wells we, we came to was one that had been drilled recently um, and uh, put together. There was nobody there. There was no one there. Um, it's like kind of like kind of like a crock pot. They just let it sit there, and from the earth's natural pressure, they pulled out they pulled out the the oil and gas, and they just put it into tanks. They separated and everything. And we were lucky enough to see a guy uh, from the company pull up, and his job was to drain the oil and uh, take it to the refinery, right? And so it's the the big expense for the drilling these oil rigs is really all the upfront costs, right? Eight twelve million dollars to to do the pad sites, to permit it, to drill it type thing, um, to frack it, get the frack crews, they are expensive. They really are. Um, now that, but they're in short supply right now too. So, you know, you could have, you know, one of the things with, with my partners that we face is that um, the patience is the key here because they're like, hey, you know, we're, we're the profits coming in. Why aren't the oil company doing this stuff? Well, the oil company wants to. Just sometimes there is a shortage of manpower that they really can't. It, it they really can't get people out there that fast because they're the crews on on well over there or over there. So they may want to drill and frack today, but the crew won't be free for another six weeks or a month or so, right? And you don't just want to throw anybody in there. Like you don't want me on your frack crew right now. Like that is not what you want. Okay, um, I could do it today, but no, do not let James be on your frack crew. Okay, um, you want someone experienced. Someone who knows this, some, some guy who who might not be able to pronounce two T's uh, when you put them together in a word, but can can tell you the amount of pressure he needs, can tell you where to go, when to stop drilling, when to hold, and when to go farther farther down. That's the guy you want, right? He may not have all of his teeth. He probably doesn't have a degree behind him, but darn it, he's been in the oil field for the last 28, 30, 45 years, and the the and he just knows his stuff. That's the guy that you want, right? Um, you don't want some, I don't want a Harvard graduate fracking for me, all right? Um, and so these guys are, are in short demand, especially as, you know, sometimes we go through periods of oil crunches, right? And that creates a barbell scenario where you have all these people with high levels of experience in their late 40s, late 50s, 60s, saying, hey, I want to retire. And you have a very small amount of people in between, you have all these you know, 20, early 30s year olds that are new but don't have the 30 years of experience that these guys do, right? And you've got this lo- very short, very small uh, window of people in between. Um, that creates a lot of tension. And the oil and gas industry is actually has gone through that. Um, I can create another video on that later. But um, so these frat crews work really hard, um, and most of the expense goes into all the sand, all the water, the frat crews setting up these wells. But once you set it up, it's just like a crock pot, man. You just, it just pumps mother nature, the pressure just puts it through the, through the, um, through the lines. And, you know, a guy or two or somebody, um, pulls the oil out every periodically, every once in a while. And then uh, if it's natural gas, they've got pipelines they send it to and just, just boom, straight to it type thing. Uh, so it was really cool to know that, that the, with drilling with oil wells, it's not like a house that you have to keep up constantly, right? You know, you might not have to repaint it or redo this or redo a toilet or something like that. Um, the the biggest expense is up front. It's like building the house, I guess you could say. You know, um, so I thought that was that was quite cool and quite knowledgeable. Um, here's another thing. So, you know, oil and gas companies get a lot of pushback, especially from environmentalists, which. I, I, I have mixed feelings about, um, you know, I, I grew up camping in Eagle Scout and everything like that, so I love nature. At the same time, I, I like to be able to drive to work and, you know, travel and see nature, okay? Um, and we use oil for that. Um, but one of the things I noticed about this is, is two things, right? Number one, these pad sites, they're about the size of, of your front and backyard combined, depending on how big your backyard is. But they're about the size of the footprint of like a 1,400, 1,500 square foot house, 
they are not very large. They're not doing a huge amount of damage to nature, okay, number one, all right? Um, they are quite small. Um, let's put it this way. We build malls and stuff. We level nature and level fields to build malls and houses and everything like that. That takes up, that affects nature way more than these pad sites do. Uh, number two, the places where we're drilling oil, we're finding it and everything, they're not the prettiest places in the world. Like there's no to trees to hug, okay? In some parts of this, of like especially West Texas, it's so flat and ugly, you can see a dog run away for four days, okay? Um, these are not places that, you know, environmentalists are like, we need to protect the, you know, the deserts of West Texas and, and the, um, the plains of Oklahoma that nobody lives in except for these cattle ranchers or something like that, you know? So uh, it, it's, when I saw that, I said, I think some of the environmental stuff, uh, again, not all of it, is a little mistaken in the way that they are, um, what they're fighting for per se, right? Um, and again, energy companies take a lot of, of responsibility for this, so it's not, unless they're BP really, but we'll go to that later. But, um, and this is not counting like offshore stuff, this is just onshore. Um, yeah, and then what we need, constant and consistent exploration. Um, we went this in the last video, but basically we've got huge energy needs and you get a huge bump in oil when you first start the well and then it kind of has diminishing returns and it levels out. Um, but if we if we stop exploring, we just use the leveled out stuff. We're not going to produce very much at all. I mean, we might instead of eleven, twelve, we might produce only five or six or seven or something like that. So we need new wells to keep that the 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 the, the, the oil and the gas coming um, to fill in the gaps for the for the decline curve, right? So um, those are some of the things that I, I really that I really learned here. But uh, one of the things I'm convinced on more and more is that the, the Anadarko region and parts of West Texas, those are definitely the places to buy some minerals at. That's why I'm happy with, with what I've got. If this interests you or you're saying, hey, James, you know, sign me up, please let me know. Contact me below and uh, we'll get you set up today.